Hey billionaires, how's it going? Nicholas Bailey here. Welcome back to another episode of the Billion Dollar Body Podcast. We're a community of like-minded businessmen that are all after one mission, having life that has it all, where we are prospering in business but not sacrificing our personal life. I'm very excited for this guest today for many different reasons. One of the biggest reasons, I don't even feel like I should be able to wash this guy's feet. I'm only 26 (laughs) years old. He's already laughing at me right here. Uh, But our interactions together came at a very specific time that I think was perfect for me and also hopefully perfect for him. I got invited to a dinner to meet this guy. Don't want to release his name yet. And it took me driving four hours to get there. And I thought that everyone was going to show up because his name was so big. I like to call him the coach to the coaches. I like to call him the consultant to the consultants. And when I showed up, it was a very intimate group that was invited and I got to meet this guy and to have the honor now to be in his office is such a big honor to me and to be able to go out there and use the things that he's gonna teach just as you're going to do to go out there and produce results so that we go out there and make a difference because I know that's his number one thing so we actually take it and produce results. So I wanna welcome my f- new friend and also mentor Jay Abraham. Nick, thank you and that's so kind. I wish my wife heard that. <laughs> Absolutely. You, you gotta call you, her and say, I wanna repeat this for you. And she go, wow. I'll send, her just the intro. I'll send her yeah, the video. That's to right. You. <laughs> okay, well, here I am, and I'm putty in your hands. What are we going to talk about? Well, the reason I said coaches to coaches, consultants to consultants, because there are people that are coaches. We talked about Tony Robbins. Sure. We talked about people like Dave Asprey. Damon yes. John's on your wall. Yes, right. he, he's thanking you. And it's, very, it's one thing to have followers, but it's another thing to actually coach leaders and to consult leaders, because they all have followers as well. And so I look at you as this guy who's on the top of the pyramid from my angle, That's as someone gracious. who's very much so influencing people either in, in front of the scenes or behind the scenes. Uh, so I just want to first say that I'm grateful. And very, it's very gracious of you. I've been very privileged to have had, a, I think, a qualitative impact on the values of certain people that influence a lot more people than I do. So that's actually what I was thinking about in the whole drive here, was the concept of human motivations. Yes. And at the very beginning, when it wasn't popular, now everyone knows you can try to make money from trying to give someone advice. Yes. But what made you so motivated at the beginning, and how did that change that motivation over time to still do it? But how did it start, that motivation, to really help businesses succeed? Uh, well, I want to say it's semi-accidental, but it was convergent, uh, I guess, Uh, what would you call it, Uh, good fortune or uh, not simpatico, but uh, I can't think of the right word. I was married the first time. I've been married many times, unfortunately, but uh, it's, I got a lot of kids, which is fortunate. I was 18, had no education, had the needs of somebody by at age 20 that was 40. Nobody cared. The only people who would engage me were crazed entrepreneurs, but not crazed in the wildness, crazed on passionate missions, purposes, uh, and I lucked out because I had a series of relationships with people who had either identified inadequacies in the, um, in the value proposition their competitors were rendering to the market or niches that weren't even being filled, and I got the privilege of being part of a broad spectrum of people who were on missions, crusades, passionate, not about making money, although that was, uh, to their great fortune, greatly uh, rewarding them. It was about passion, about making their audience, their market better, helping them be more successful, helping them do a better job. And that really, after a while, became a driving force in my life. And then I lucked out because I you know, I don't know if it was fate, whether it was good fortune, whether it was, you know, whatever, but I associated 95% of the time with people outstanding in their values, outstanding in their character, outstanding in their ethos, outstanding in their belief systems, but not rigid, so outstanding in their open minded expansiveness. And I guess if you're fortunate enough to be around that many people with those aggregate attributes, some of it should rub off. So you're talking about people that you've consulted, people that you've worked with, but as a human being, when you talk about their character or their belief systems or maybe their uh, morals, what is something that you look for and that these businessmen can really resemble as a person that you not only would work with, but that you'd actually enjoy hanging out with, that you go, oh, you have these things? I really enjoy that. 
I look for people who are uh, obsessed with a couple of different things. One, being a multiplier and not a diminisher. And by that I mean making everyone around them better off because they, their business, their company is in their lives. I look at these people as wanting to grow and develop their team, wanting to do more and more value-based contribution to their market. I am obsessed with people who knowingly or unknowingly are on a on a mission to be preeminent. I've done an enormous amount of work on preeminence, which is a much more elevated uh, strata of conducting your business personal life, and it's liberating, intoxicating, and, uh, and exhilarating. I'm driven to be associated with people who manifest greatness, but by greatness, I don't necessarily mean they have to be iconic. I mean, in what they're trying to do, they are, they are committed to doing it in the finest way, with the best interest, and living a life that is truly meaningful so that when that life is over, which I'm not uh, morose, the world is better off. They didn't take oxygen out of it. And that goes dimensionally. It can be a little person, big person. I think everybody has relevancy. I think everybody deserves dignity. I love anybody, no matter their age, their education, their status. I love the human condition and I've been blessed by getting contagiously obsessed with the wonderment of human beings since I was younger than you. And it's fortunately, it hasn't subsided yet. And I hope it continues the rest of, I hope it'll be a, a rich and long life. So now you've hooked us into preeminence though. Yes. You, you, the way that you described it, intoxicating even, is a really cool term to use because it's something that's almost uncontrollable. Yes. And so, it's, it's positively addicting. It's, it's one of the few addictions that I couldn't recommend more that everybody get hooked on. So explain it further. Okay, so the good news, I believe very, very strongly in acknowledging uh, origin and, uh, and attribution. So I had a client years ago that was many times more successful than their closest competitor. They were many times more profitable. They had many, much more qualitative and pricey products and their market loved them, and the competitor's market just tolerated them. And I did a trade, I traded a half a million dollars of my consulting for the privilege of spending a week with them, interviewing all their executives and the, the president, founder, owner, to try to figure out what the driver was of this combined and this almost mythical level of achievement. And what I, I took about a thousand pages of notes. Then I distilled it, excuse my, my mouth, uh, I distilled it down to uh, a thesis, which I called the strategy of preeminence, and it's gotten more advanced over the years. It takes about three hours to fully explain it, but I will, number one, explain it in its uh, brevity, with, breath, with brevity, and then if you'd like, I will give you some longer video audio, and you can let them reside on your website if that helps your people get a greater idea. But it starts with, wanting to be seen as the most trusted advisor in any aspect of your life, whether it's friendship, love, uh, employee, employer, uh, manager, friend, whatever it is. That is only possible if you are willing to have a perspective that is rich and authentic and not patronize. That is only possible if you respect and care enough to listen, hear, and, and interact with people in the business arena, which is where we start with it, 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 uh, it comes first and foremost from realizing that there are so many people in this world who are tormented and uh, almost driven mad with goals, fears, objectives, aspirations that not only are not fulfilled, but they don't even know how to put words clearly into what they're trying to get close to away from in any aspect of their life. And there's many aspects, not just the business, the personal, the health, as you know, the, the relationship, the financial, everything else. So it starts with being able to verbalize in clear cut uh, uh, phrases and, 
and uh, communication that I, I really feel what you feel. I know where you are in your mind and I, uh, I get that. If you're a company, you need to be able to do that for your team members and express that very clearly to the people that buy from you, your clients. You want to be seen as the most trusted advisor, the only viable choice anybody could make. And that's possible because you understand the market better. And I'll give you a really killer way to do that authentically in a few minutes, but let's go through some of the more, more important parts. If you're selling product service and you know that your product service company support Anything, everything about it is superior in outcome to what you're competing against either directly or indirectly because there's lots of competition in your field and uh, you're, you do a lot of health, right? Yeah. Okay, well, let's take a look. In health, there's, there's exercise, fitness, supplements, portion control food, uh, equipment, all kinds of you know, personal trainer. There's all these different variable ways and there's, there's the direct competitor. So you want to be knowing that if you do more, if your product service company supports more, that you have a moral obligation and almost a, uh, a, a responsibility to not let people you could help not deal with you. You also have a responsibility to not allow them to buy less than they should in less quantity, quality, frequency than they should, but also not let them buy more than they should. <coughs> Pardon me. You have to start by having a vision in your mind of not the generic product or service business you're in, but how it impacts their life. For example, if you're selling a computer, you can get very depressed because it's a pretty generic piece of equipment, isn't it? Yep. Technology. But if you realize that computer is helping them save hours in their life, it's helping them organize their finances, it's helping them uh, you know, not, not get out of control. It's helping them have free time to work if they're a, uh, an infopreneur, an expert, a solopreneur, whatever it is, you've got to be able to look to the benefit and then look that benefit beyond. When I talk to realtors, for example, we talk about you're not selling a house, you're transforming the lives of that family for, you know, for generations. Because if you help them select the right environment, the, 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 the working family members, the husbands, wives, uh, partners are gonna be much happier and see purpose-driven fulfillment. They're gonna get greater joy uh, when they come home and satisfaction, weekends, the neighborhood's gonna be great. The children will be in a better environment. Uh, the house will appreciate, so you know in your heart you're helping them create wealth. They're gonna have great memories. And if you can't live in that kind of a a, Tony would call it a future-paced world, then you're very linear and they can't do that. The next thing and probably uh, very important is you've got to learn to express yourself to others in terms of metaphors, similes, analogies, very easy ways for people to understand, not that just you get them, but what you are rep representing for them, whether it's the security of a job in the future, whether it's product service, whether it's take my product uh, into your store or distributor, whatever it is, and you can't do that if you don't really learn to study metaphors and similes, and if you need proof of its power, think of any, any uh, religion, parables, the stories that demonstrate the, really the, the message. It, it's how human's brain works best. Then, this is really the key, you've gotta learn to not fall in love with your business or your career or your job or your company, pardon me, but instead fall in love with the people you are, your company and you as a part of it are impacting and that goes three ways. It goes obviously, well let me say it differently, you don't deal with customers and the reason you don't is if you look up a Webster's dictionary definition of a customer, it's somebody who buys a commodity or a uh, product it, or a service. It's not, it's, it's a generic, very, very commoditized transaction. And if you refer to people as a customer and you're trying to be preeminent, you're self uh, negating. You're saying, I'm no better than everybody else. I have not special, nothing about me, my business, my job, my, my life, my conduct, I'm just average. 
If you call them a client, you look up the definition of a client. We're on a runway, so you're going to hear planes go all the time. And there's also one of the largest helicopter manufacturers down the road that tests all these cool helicopters all the time. Back to the ranch. If, if you uh, refer to everybody as a client, the definition is somebody under the care, the protection, the well-being of another. The responsibility, the relationship is different. People who grasp this, and I'm, uh, well, I'll, I mean, I have a great analogy. Let's say this happens to be a half of a bottle of water. Let's say that I have Jay Abraham's uh, uh, water bar and bottled water shop, and Nick comes in, throws money on the, on the bar, and says, I want a half a bottle of water. If I take your money without first making sure you are aware that your body, your cellular structure, your brain, your, your digestive system, your elimination system, your, your functioning, your stress level, everything is predicated on you getting seven and a half more of these every day. And if I don't do everything in my power to first make sure you're aware and second, make sure that you get it, whether you get it from me or not is secondary, then I have stolen from you and I've stolen from my opportunity. Conversely, if you buy the eight, eight bottles or the eight glasses, whatever the equivalent, this is about a glass, and, and you come every other day and I don't go out of my way to say, Nick, it's cool that you're getting eight every other day, but that's not it, man. You need eight more and I don't care if you get them from me, you have this responsibility to make everyone the best they can be. And you wanna grow and develop everybody, you, you, you wanna do more, and you have to then understand value creation because what you value and what I value is not the same. You're doing a very gracious job of nodding affirmation, but the truth of the matter is, if two people have the same conversation, the odds of the, each one having the same definitions is absolutely low. I'll give you an example. I used to do very, very, very large seminars all over the country and the world. I don't anymore. But when I did, I would wait until the second of a third day, a three day event when I had the trust and I would purposely about halfway through come in late. And what I'm gonna say is not sexist, but it does refer to women. So I would come in late purposely, 10 minutes and say, I am so apologetic, but I just saw the most stunning woman I think I'd ever seen outside. And I was mesmerized, captivated and, and just stunned. And then I'd say nothing else and go on. And then about a half an hour later, I'd say, remember the woman I was talking about? I'm curious to see what came to your mind. And I'd go randomly around the room. Very interesting. To some men, it was anatomically denominated. To some people, it was ethnically denominated. To some people, it was uh, uh, physically, but not, not grossly. To women, it was sophisticated and, uh, and more conservative. But if I had believed that stunning, beautiful meant somebody with uh, unusual anatomy and tacky clothes who was 21 and looked a little bit like they should be walking the streets in Las Vegas, I probably would have eliminated the definition that 95% of the rest of the room had. So value creation is much more uh, important and you can't really try to shove your values down my throat because I'm not you, you have to, you're not, no one is playing the same game. The owner of the business is playing a different game than the team member. The, the client you're selling is, is playing a different game and a lot of these people use the same rhetoric, the same you know, shallow, superficial copy. And it really doesn't go to what they're feeling, what they're wanting, what they uh, are trying to get close or away from. I don't know if this helps or not. Absolutely. Even talking about the one, figuring out their value. So mm -hmm. you're not selling someone who doesn't need what you have, which is the definition of the old school salesperson knocking on every door saying that you need to buy this water and they don't even have any type of real value for it. They don't want it. And then the second thing is making, once they're actually in your shop mm -hmm. or interested in that product or service, to actually give them educated on the correct way, the best thing for them. 
and then getting them to make that decision. And you talked a lot about values. You talked a lot about educating and having a moral obligation to edu- educate. We talked a little bit before, and we've seen that young entrepreneurs, newer entrepreneurs, new school entrepreneurs, they sometimes aren't used to this human interaction. They're sometimes, good on video. Sometimes. <laughs> They're almost never good at human interaction because it's just not valued anymore. You're exactly right. And that's why I love doing this in person because it, it also creates more value for the conversation. I think it does, and I'm very impressed that you go to this effort rather than doing it by Skype. I think that younger entrepreneurs, there's a fallacy that has occurred. This concept of the world being connected is almost, uh, it's almost uh, 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 the opposite. They're disconnected. I think the greatest attribute you can, uh, well, I just, in fact, I'm, I'm changing the subject. It's not an ADD moment, but saying ADD is really cool because I just did this wonderful interview, which I can also give you to put on your website, uh, with the absolute most uh, respected expert in the world on entrepreneurial ADD, ADAD. And his biggest, biggest, biggest recommendation is don't worry alone and get a lot more vitamin C. And he's not talking about the supplement. He's talking about connection, real connection, being with people, talking, listening, eye contact, reflecting, uh, examining, evaluating other people's perspective, growing, allowing yourself to grow way outside your comfort zone, uh, appreciating, respecting, uh, and acknowledging all kinds of other people's realities. That's what makes life really enriching, and that's what makes entrepreneurship really successful. And I think that we're going so far away from that with younger people, and I'm not being critical of them. I think the capacity that they have to achieve is limitless, but the amount of understanding they have about that capacity is almost uh, zero. When you talked about building the relationships, that's where we focus our number one, the, our, all of our focus really is. I noticed that there's a gap now in building relationships, building relationship equity or, or relationship capital, yes. whatever words people want to sure. associate that with. And we've noticed the gap where that's literally our number one focus is to have these types of interactions. Congratulations. While everyone else is trying to email 50,000 people right now, though we can do that at the same yeah, sure, time, obviously. Course. My focus is different. It's for the one. And I, we talked about there's been some people out there that haven't had this self-awareness almost to be able to have that same type of integrity that maybe you saw in the past, or maybe that you walk with after living this life for so long and going through so many different business transactions. What would you say to them, since it is your moral obligation to really, you have an opportunity to educate sure. them, what is missing? What are they doing when... You know, they, they back out on a contract or they don't follow through on what they say. They don't show up on time. They don't they don't honor the handshake. Do you really feel comfortable with a millennial or anyone at the fact in business right now to give them a handshake and actually expect for them to show up and do it without signing a contract, without a lawyer? How, it, I how mean, I, 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 absolutely not in most conditions. Also, I think communication. You're talking about connection, but I don't even think that uh, a lot of of younger people, and it could be X and millennials, and then go down to Y. They don't even understand how acknowledging people is so important. Uh, they don't really appreciate the value of a phone call. They uh, arbitrarily respond to other people when it's convenient for them, which is their prerogative, but if you're doing business or building a relationship, that's not a preferred way to transact business. It's a very, very, uh, it's a very, it's, it's not only uh, inappropriate, but it's a turnoff. But I don't think, here's the good news. I don't think, there's, there's no shame in not knowing. And if no one really gives you uh, a bigger, better, uh, uh, much more, uh, what would we call it? Tony calls it juice, but a much more uh, enriching, sort of a, of a tapestry of how to expand the, the richness of your life, then, you know, it's not really your fault. But Ignorance once, is bliss. Yeah, but once you've been exposed to all that's possible, and if you do nothing about it, then it is your fault. I've done a lot of work on uh, greatness, 
And uh, I'd, I'd like to share a little bit because I think it might have some relevancy and then we can talk about anything else you want. But I believe every human being is born with in their DNA, unless there's some aberration, birth, you know, birth defect, uh, mental uh, impairment. Every human being is born in their DNA with a desire to in, innately be great at, and you can fill in the blank, if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to be a career-minded person, a professional, a husband, wife, parent, lover, friend. And yet if you look statistically, the, the a number of people that achieve greatness, and I'm not talking about celebrity. I'm not talking about the world knowing who you are. I'm talking about a different kind of a greatness, which is which is playing full out, which is which is making the world better off every time you're in anybody's life, which is which is listening, which is uh, appreciating, which is committing to grow and stretch and uh, and really uh, develop your connectivity in a, in a humanized way. If, if you don't really know how to do that and you don't really know, you know where you are now, then you're really rudderless. But if you're programmed to be great in all these areas and yet you're not, you don't even know it. First thing is you have to be aware that you have within you the capacity to achieve uh, you know, orders of magnitude more uh, growth, development. Uh, I don't want to even use the word success. Let's say impactful expansion of your being. It's going to sound a little abstract, but there's there's four or five really uh, intimidating and and Im- Repeating factors you got to overcome. First of all, if you have eight, I think there's about eight categories that you could be: physical, financial, career, uh, relationship, uh, self-esteem. There's a lot of different areas. You have to first take a look at all of them and get a gauge of where you are vis-a-vis where you want to be. And you can't know where you want to be until you have some reference models. So you have to look at people you admire. And you have to look at people you admire beyond just the, as we said, the insulated room you work on, work out of or the world you live in. You've got to transcend that. Who do you really admire in business? Who do you admire in, uh, in not you know, uh, the supreme athlete, but just somebody who really has their life together and good physical, good balance? Who do you admire who've got a relationship, whether it's marital, whether it's just, you know, communal, whether it's, you know, hetero, homosexual, who do you really admire? Uh, Who have you seen who is not born with a silver spoon, who's been able to create financial security? You go through the whole thing and then you say, okay, and you figure out three or four or five or seven different reference examples and you aggregate, excuse me, the, the elements within that admiration that are the driving attributes you really admire. Then you say, okay, this is what I'd like to be. Then you have to say with, with sobriety, where am I now in this? So you gotta figure out what the, what what's called the gap. But you have to know the gap in everything because there tends to be in our lives what I'll call a log jam. There's one gap that could be the, uh, the constraint that is really, uh, uh, suppressing all of these. Not that you even knew it was possible. You get this orientation. You can be very successful. You can have a great... But there's a lot more to it than I think a lot of the the veneer rhetoric that people render for or not for compensation. But first thing is you got to figure out what do you want it to look like because anything is possible within reason. Where are you now? Where's the logjam you got to deal with first? You may be struggling in your career business, but if your relationship is a nightmare, or your health is a nightmare, or your finances are a nightmare, and they're driving you diversionary crazy, you gotta fix that first, because you'll never, (coughs) pardon me, get out of it. So, first thing you have to do if you want greatness in your life, is realize that if you only seek one facet, you're lopsided. And when you're lopsided, 
you can't be balanced. And balance is the key to existence. It really is. And I'm not advocating uh, new age. I'm not advocating yoga or any spirituality, although I'm fascinated by all of that. I'm advocating that you can't be your best if you're lopsided. You, so the first thing is figure out what you want it to look like and why. And the why is who you admire and the admiration needs to be extended past the rigors of your own existence. Because if all you do is admire other people that work out of a cubicle and other people that just date a different girl every night, take them home, get rid of them, and that's the kind of relationship you want, you should probably, in my in my uh, worldview, rethink your values, but that's a different that's a different discussion. So you got all these different areas. Let's take business and career because that's what you deal with. So let's say you're here and you know that your goal is aspirationally to get here and now at least you've got a picture, it's a little more dimensional, a lot more dimensional of what this should look like. And you translate that to your own life because you can't, I can't be you, you can't be me, but you can adopt, adapt and extrapolate my attributes and say, I, I want to be the equivalent of that in my in my life, not Jay, you can't be Jay, I can't be Nick, but what is it about Jay that I like that I can take threads from and weave into my own fabric? So now you know what you want it to look like in each category. You know where you are. Now what do you have? Some gap. Most people a big gap. So now you got to figure out, first of all, what path will get you there. And there's an infinite number of paths. And, you know, there's, you know, I could list right now a thousand options. So the first thing you have to do is learn optimization, excuse me, optimization, which is the highest and the best use of time, opportunity, uh, effort, uh, passion, purpose, anything. And you've got to say, okay, of all these options, which one or ones offer the safest? Safest is the most important, not fastest. Because fastest is, there's a difference between uh, uh, crock cooked meat and flash seared. They both look brown on the outside, but if you go below the surface, the seared is still raw as can be. And you want to, you want to accomplish growth to greatness in all the categories that is sustainable and that becomes automatic and becomes uh, a natural part of your conduct and existence. You don't want to have to think about it or topple because you got to someplace too fast. This is what happens to a lot of people on a diet. They lose all this weight and they go right back. But, but so now you've got all these options. You figure out which approaches are the safest and the most enduring. And that means you don't want to be a pole vaulter and just go right out. You're better basically whatever you do, they call it when you go to a, up a mountain sideways because it's safer. So, and you realize that you can't judge, like if this is your goal and you start out on a path that you uh, figure out is the, the very best for you based on who you are, what you're going to do and the safety, not the rapidity. If you make this much progress when you start out, you cannot fixate on what you have not done because you'll get depressed. You got to fixate on how wonderful it is that you're here instead of here. Now, it gets a little more complicated. Is this okay to talk Absolutely, about? Absolutely, because that's even hitting me right there. Okay, so here's where it gets really difficult. I don't know many people who are blessed enough that the first time they try to do anything outside their comfort or skill set, they do it right. And if you think about it, and I don't remember, you don't have children? No? Not yet. Okay, well, I have seven. And I can remember all of them pretty well when they started to walk, talk, eat, speak, go poo-poo, ride bikes. If you had allowed them to just do what they did first, they never would have learned to do any of those things because they failed miserably and they needed someone who was their advocate champion to pick them up, to stand them up, to let them walk three steps and fall again and go, yay, great. And they went, blah, blah, and say, oh, that's wonderful. And when they almost made it to the bathroom, yes. And when they got on the bike, it went, bloop, Hey, look, he went five feet. That's wonderful. So 
we need somebody to support us through that. And it doesn't have to be a professional, although it can, but somebody who cares enough about our greatness in all the calibers, because when you realize the greatness is within your reach, the, uh, the payoff is, it's not just outsized, it's unimaginably more exquisite, both financially, uh, psychically, uh, joyously, happiness, than you can imagine. But if you don't, you're gonna be left to that life of quiet desperation or all the lonely people and not even know why because there aren't a lot of people out there sharing these kind of views with you. And if you're reinforced by people that are sharing the same views, one could argue that that's toxic, but one could also argue that the people sharing the views have never been really influenced to a, a higher, a better, a wider, a richer, deeper, broader reality, so they don't know you know, they don't know w what is possible. I'm probably babbling, but does this make sense? As you said, that not many people are talking about this. I agree. Not talking about what do you want, who's modeling, and I think you said it really well one time that was you have to learn to play someone else's music before you ever learn how to play your own. And when I look at why we even putting on Billion Dollar Body Live and why, why we're bringing you out there is because of this message. It's very different. It's very authentic. Very much your story. And we created three things or two different models, really, that our guys are following right now. It's the, the 3D businessman, which is prospering in health, business, relationships, and they all have subcategories. But it's balance. Very much balance. And there are priorities, of course. Yes. That their health and they are first, which is something that's also not taught. Nope. And it's you know mental, physical, spiritual. And then you got business. There's many different facets, not just one word. There's many different things that need to get done. And in the relationship, there's the intimate relationship first with my wife. That's gotta be above my friends. It's gotta be above my family. So balance there. And then the second thing is 3D business, which I think you'll really eat up, and I have to tell you. Please. It's something that I was just thinking about. What is really setting everyone apart now from just having another product or service, like a water bottle? What's making them different? What really hit it for us, and a lot of it that I took away from the books that I've read of yours and the videos I've watched, are having a mission or vision that's bigger than your product or service that people can get behind even if they don't even care what they're buying. And one thing that's happened with these live events is that the people will come and not even know what they got yeah. just because they want to be a part of the mission of redefining what it means to be a businessman with this type of balance. So that's something that we came out with that's worked very well. And I second, think that's wonderful. Second thing, a product or service that sells a need or a problem, not just is a product that sells, and no offense to Coca-Cola, but total offense really, is that I don't like the product. Though McDonald's, I don't like the product either, but they have Ronald McDonald House. Yep. And so not having something of giving that can cover up a bad product anymore in our community whatsoever. Yes. And then the third thing, a place to give back. Because I really feel it's very weird if you're working so hard for the sake of just yourself and don't have a big vision to somehow support or give back to. And I think there's a quote, more blessed is the man who gives than the man who receives. It's very interesting to me. Could you imagine having a billion dollars and just giving it away and, they, and you're the more blessed? How is that even possible? So actually, I'd like for you to touch on that because maybe yeah. you have more insight into that than me. I do. But I'm thinking a billion dollars. If I had a billion dollars right now and I gave it away, more blessed the hand that gives than he who receives. I believe it's because it's givings for us because it changes me. But what are your thoughts on it? Well, uh, I'm going to make you laugh or cry and probably make <laughs> your viewers and, and uh, clients do the same. So I'm much older than you, and I, I'd like to... Oh, by the way, I need to make a point. My life has been defined by the expanse of industries, not, not businesses, but industries I've been blessed to be exposed to. Traveling broadens your mind in the, in the uh, 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 recreational sense, traveling outside of your comfort zone into industries that think differently, operate differently, market sell, value create differently, gives you such a broader understanding of what is possible. And that's why I urge everyone to stretch. And I'll give you some uh, stretch exercises before we're done, but I'll tell you a story. And it's personal, and it's funny, sad, liberating, all at once. So I've gone through three midlife crises. First was at 40, the next was at 50, and the next was at 60. At 40, I'd made all this money, a lot for my age, 
and I had all these cars, and I had about every experience you can imagine, good, bad, you know, wonderful, not so uh, uh, fun, and I was miserable. Then I had millions of dollars in the bank, and I was trying to figure it out. And I got really frustrated going to uh, a professional, a therapist, who right when you're on the precipice of a breakthrough says, oh, your time is up, you gotta come back uh, next week, your 55 minutes is up. And I tried to get a better outcome the second time, and I didn't. And I basically found I got the same benefit buying an expensive car and then selling it at a huge loss. And then I got rid of my stress, which sounds stupid. But when I got to the third one, I decided I was going to get this problem resolved for once and for all. So I went to a very knowledgeable guy that was respected, and I bought him for a week. I bought him for an entire week. And my deal with him, which was hilarious, was if I'll come when I'm ready. And when I'm not ready, from 8 until 5, you're on my payroll. I wasn't mean about it, but I said, I'm going to send everybody I know, if I, I'm not, not ready to talk, who needs it but would never ever... And he was laughing his ass off because he never knew what kind of a, of a uh, problem, fraught, and crazed person I would send him from elements of my life. But when I was ready, I would go there and we would talk for hours. And after talking for hours, he gave me one big conclusive uh, insight, which was worth the entire $500,000 I spent on therapy all my life. And it profoundly transformed uh, my values, my uh, worldview, my drive, my uh, everything. And here's what he said. The majority of people are obsessed with an end product. You want to be the biggest in your in your sector. You want to be the fastest growing business. You want to have the the uh, the biggest house, the most amount of money, the most gorgeous wife or husband. Uh, if you're unlucky enough to achieve that for that reason alone, and you think that uh, the heavens are going to open, the angels are going to appear, trumpets are going to serenade you, and and nirvana and and joy and unfettered happiness will now be yours, it's BS. It just magnifies the problems by because you got more money to spend and more time to think about how screwed up your life is. What life is all about is not the end product, it's the process. This conversation, it's wonderful that we're leveraging it through hopefully hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions of people is as good as it gets. But it's wonderful that we're having this very stimulating discussion, but if I were sitting on a bus stop with uh, uh, a menial worker, he or she is just as relevant as you or some of the more elevated uh, colleagues that I counsel or who I uh, collaborate with. Everybody has value. Everyone has uh, something really interesting to share. Being engaged is the answer. So now what I do after that is uh, I take the time to talk to everybody and listen and try to understand their world. I, uh, when I travel, this is very fun, when I travel to, uh, everyone knows this about me, when I go to uh, Asia, which I go to a lot, I get to fly on very, very elegant uh planes, uh, you know, airlines of my choice, and I go first class, and they have good wines, so I drink them. And so the first day that I'm there, I hydrate <laughs> and, and sleep for about 15 hours so that I can be uh, on purpose. And my on purpose, because I get there three days early, is the first, the second day I sit in the lobby for four hours and smile at people until they smile back. Then the next two hours I ride the elevator and do the same thing up and down just for the giggle. Then I get off on the various floors and talk and acknowledge meaningfully and respectfully to the housekeepers or the servers. Because acknowledgement and valued, being valued is so important to all of humanity. My wife thinks I'm insane because I read the obituaries every day, but I don't read the high celebrity ones. I read the ones about the wife who was involved in the, you know, in the church choir or who uh organized uh you know feed the poor or the or the the you know the the 
husband who had a company for 40 years and was you know active in the chambers and all these things and you think about lives i have uh regrettably a number of my relatives who are deceased but when i go to the cemetery to pay respects i go past i do them first but then i walk for another couple of hours all the way back to the 1800s can i think about the lives that existed then and i'm very much into the value of human lives and i think a lot of young people don't really respect that if you're an employer or you're growing to be an employer, if you're a solopreneur, what you have to realize is when you have team members, they're putting their faith, their hopes, their dream, hitching their wagon to your star. You're on a different mission and you have to be someone willing to grow, develop. As I said, you're a multiplier or a diminisher. You make people better. You make the world around you better. You make uh, ordinary people exceptional. You listen to their ideas, you acknowledge them, you respect them, or you demean them or destroy them. And I think that a lot of young people have missed out on the joy of connecting and contributing and, uh, what's the word I want to use, uh, uh, not just absorbing, but appreciating the human condition. And I think without that, you'll never be great. How has life changed then since that third midlife crisis? Uh, and so each time you had 40, 50, and 60, and at 60, this is what had spurted. Yeah. And from that, what's the difference? Well, there's a lot of differences. First, I don't make as much money because I'm not as money motivated. If you are familiar with my website, we give away uh, really better resources than many or most of my colleagues sell. We don't ask for an opt-in. If you want to give it to me, fine. I, uh, I travel for two reasons. I get paid uh, truthfully, very handsomely if I want, but I'll also do uh, meaningful uh, groups that I think I can impact and I'll waive my fee. I uh, try in my communications with whoever follows me to do a lot of worldview and not just marketing. I think there's plenty of people teaching tactical marketing. I tend to be very strategic. I think that I am authentic because I have a love for humanity that, and a fascination with everyone and everything. Uh, I don't take, I don't take re reversals very seriously. I have had some physical and some health uh, issues and our, our business has you know, we get paid a lot of money when we're paid a lot of money, and I have been owed a lot of money that I didn't get paid from people. And it, 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 I take life more joyously than I do seriously, if that makes sense. It doesn't mean that I don't contribute full out to people, but I think it's a great privilege to be here. I think it's a great experience. It's a great adventure. And that may sound too metaphorically or metaphysical, but, yeah, I'm having a good time. So you're your number one asset in your life? Uh, well, I mean, I have a very a, a remarkable and extraordinary wife who's been a, just an exceptionally great uh, mother to not only uh, our natural children, but children from two other marriages, which is, uh, I'm very fortunate. I have three families, and they all get along masterfully, and they, they go on vacation together, and at the holidays they come and go to movies and play games on TV together, and it's very gratifying. I have uh, probably one of the most uh, eclectic and rich groups of friends. Most of my friends are way above my intellectual or pay grade, which is fascinating because I think I intrigue them because I'm one gradient probably a little uh, below crazy. But I get to associate with very quality people. You know, I've got wonderfully impressive people that I get to mentor. Uh, I'm involved, I've been involved in over a thousand industries. I get to, you know, I still do a full day uh, with Tony Robbins, he and I together, back and forth, giving problem solving advice to his highest paying group of people, which I think is, is, is a giggle. I get to travel, you know, I've traveled not around the world, but I've traveled uh, to you know all five continents in aggregate by trips that probably be 80 or 90 and I've never 
had to pay for them and I've always gotten hosted wonderfully and I get I attract a quality of entrepreneurs that are trying to make their lives more meaningful and add more value they just don't know how uh, yeah I mean uh, you know I I uh, we were talking about it I I uh, I I do a lot of zany things for fun. I, ha I I do clients that can't afford me. I'll have them get me a car, and I'll do a modified uh, job. And I just got rid of one that I had, and they're always really unique cars because I like cars. I don't like to drive. I just like the sort of the process of getting them. And we just did a deal where we're getting a brand new. G63 AMG and a brand, not a brand new, uh, a one-year-old uh, GTS. And I won't even drive them, but it's a giggle. We had a Bentley we traded for, and we had a, a, a very sophisticated uh, Audi that was one of 500. And I get I get to do, I, I got art in my home from some of the famous artists who couldn't afford to pay me. And, and I have joyous delight in looking at how people express their take on life. I, I think that I've been blessed by people who had passion, purpose, and they saw uh, a much, much broader, higher, deeper sense of possibility. And it's uh, it's rubbed off on me. And the, I've been blessed also uh, with somebody that when I was a little younger than you, I could have gone the wrong way. I was too bright for my own good. And one of my many mentors, I have so many that have influenced me and been gracious to me, I can't even name them all. But he took me aside and he said something that's changed my direction. He said, Jay, you can lose all your money and as long as you keep your integrity, somebody will always back you or hire you or uh, support you. But if you keep your money and sell out your integrity, you'll never get your integrity back. And that was a very profound shift because I could have gone either way. I could have gone fast and furious down a, a, a darker path, and that was a wake-up call. So I try to basically share. Now, you know, my day job is building businesses, so if I sound like I'm this uh, metaphysical person that's just all about uh, very ethereal things, uh, in all immodesty, I have billions and billions and billions of dollars of very documented success, and I have been very blessed to help some of the most respected entrepreneurs and icons. But these are the values that drive the specifics. It's not just being a great strategist or a great tactician or a great business modeler or a great creator of value or a great... A uh, person who can outthink everybody else. It's the values that drive all those actions, if that makes sense. You touched on leverage there as well. Yeah. And this has been something to me that's, I don't know, I just think it's one of the coolest concepts of exchanging value. You talked about the paintings, yep. people that couldn't afford you. You talked about the cars yep. and how, how fun the experiences are. And it's probably actually even more fun rather than getting paid and buying the car because you never would. No, so I would never. I wouldn't buy a couple of brand new Mercedes. Yeah, but but it's a giggle. But it's fun, and and, and you get to do what you love while you do it. Well, see, well. but I have an advantage over certain people. My billing rate's very high. Yeah, so it's easy for me to exchange. Yeah, but they they might get a you know water bottle on exchange. Yeah, yeah that's like, true. So tell us a, a little what? bit about leverage, leverage? then, and, sure. and just sure. just so people get a little bit of. Like yeah, we, and it's, we it's good that over. you take me there, and I'm 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 grateful because it's a profoundly. Uh, little understood and outrageously uh, huge area. So everything in my life, in the beginning unrecognized uh, by me, but then fully recognized and accelerated and elevated, has been focusing on how to get uh, greater upside leverage. There's two kinds of cholesterol, you know that. You, 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 you teach it. If you have too much of the bad, you're dead. If you have enough of the good and not too much of the bad, but some bad, it'll supposedly negate it. Well, there's two kinds of leverage. There's a kind of leverage where you uh, go on, uh, on out on a limb and you either buy a house or a business or equipment or expand or advertising, hoping and praying it will either yield uh, a positive return on the investment or appreciate or both. And if they do, you're fine. If they don't, you're screwed. I don't deal with negative leverage in business. I try to compartmentalize it to only that which has 
near infinite upside and almost no downside and very little investment, if any. And it started out when I was young, we did the product Icy Hot and we didn't have any money and I was charged with establishing partnerships very deeper than what an affiliate a relationship would be today with uh, radio stations, television stations, magazines, newspapers, and we did it with a thousand of them. We took this unknown product and we, at ICAT today is, you know, it's promoted by, uh, uh, who is it? Uh, Shaquille, Shaquille O'Neal, right? And, and uh, we built it to a huge company for no cash at all. Uh, and that's a whole different story. Then I started learning about how to work on the geometry of a business. And there's probably 50 different uh, powerful mechanisms, vehicles, and uh, methodologies that everyone watching has to use geometry and leverage instead of capital. Uh, a few examples is we teach the three ways to grow a business. Basically, you can increase the number of prospects and thus buyers by converting more. You can increase the size of the transaction. You can increase the frequency or the utility of the transaction. Uh, we have a very simple chart that shows if you just do 10% across the board, and we use an example of a thousand buyers and uh, I think a hundred dollar unit of sale and two times purchases a year, you get a 33%, a 10% increase across the board is 33%. A 40% increase across the board is something like 500%. Doubling is eight or 900%. That's one facet. We created the Power Parthenon, which is going after your market from multiple vantage points, which is very much like the military does in a war, where they would start with uh, intelligence gathering, uh, reconnaissance, then they would probably do, uh, they knock out the infrastructure, the telephone system, cellular, radio, TV, uh, electricity, then they would either bomb or surface to air missiles, then they would do uh, tanks, and then if they needed it, infantry. And they didn't really care which one really knocked out the enemy as long as one does or the cumulative. Well, we built a mechanism where you should have eight or nine different pillars of access to your market and it gives you outrageous um, and enormous continuous leverage. We've figured out three advanced ways to create leverage. One is penetrating a new market every year. The other is creating a new product or service every year. The next is acquiring either a competitive company or a company that either is a product or service that people buy before, during, or after, or even instead of yours, and buying it on an earnout where you don't have to pay anything and it pays its own way and becomes a lead source, or you become a lead source for that. We have taken the revenue system, which most people don't know has about 51 impact points in it, each one of which can be leveraged up from the way you target your market, your proposition, your congruency when they come in, what happens when they hit the landing page, what you're, I mean, all, if it's that, if you do it in person, if you're a salesperson, we've tested different ways of, of greeting people at the front door and found ways that uh, quintupled the conversion. We found uh, uh, ways to isolate different categories of buyers that uh, because all buyers aren't the same. If you look at sourcing, conversion, I'm getting a little deep now, I'm getting out of my metaphysical world into really transactionalization and, and rolling up my sleeves. But if you have different buyers that have come from either different source media, different propositions, different products, they're not all worth the same. And if you don't know what their relative value is, and we were teaching lifetime value, LTV back 40 years ago when nobody knew it. We were teaching USP when nobody knew it. And I'm not saying it to be arrogant. I'm saying that we've been focused on all the ways and that doesn't count uh, what I call OPR, other people's resources. We've used, we've got a hundred different ways, actually more, of using other people's distribution, other people's brand, other people's uh, facilities, other people's uh, uh, sales force, other people's credit, other people's, I mean, just we've got, We've got $2 billion directly and indirectly that has been created in revenue for clients just by doing that. I did a quarter billion dollars of seminars and I think I spent all of it, maybe $200,000 in the whole period 
to do it because we were able to use Tony Robbins and Success Magazine and uh, 50 different financial newsletters and seminar companies. And, and I was a, a very, very uh, clinically, not arrogantly, I was a pioneer in very deep and, and uh, very intricately forged strategic alliances, joint ventures, and what we call power path uh, partnering, which is way, way, way beyond what most people think of as an affiliate. You really have an unlimited checkbook. And I'll give you an example because we haven't given many examples. Uh, this is a Chinese example, but it's pretty cool. So when I first started going to China eight years ago, a young man came to the mic and through translation asked a question because I had Q&A and he said, Jay, what do you do if you're too small and the banks won't lend you money to grow? And I always ask you, what would you do if you had the money? People go, well, what do you mean? I said, just like that. If, if tomorrow morning you had, what do you want, two million, five million? Okay, you got it. What are you going to do with it? And he said, well, I'm a local motorcycle manufacturer. Only in China, where they have a hundred million population city, could you be a local motorcycle manufacturer? And he said, I'd love to go all over Asia, create a factory, hire salespeople, get, uh, you know, get wholesalers and get dealers. And I said, okay. So why do you need the money? He just said, I just told you. I said, not really. You can find that your problem, par problem, excuse me, is the solution to somebody's bigger if but that they may not know it. I said, go all over Asia, find somebody who's not competitive, but is complimentary, has a big factory, is not being used, has um, um, a sales force, already has distribution and partner with them. And that was, would that take me, uh, 30 seconds? So I came back about 15 months later and there's this young man again and he's smiling like the Cheshire cat. You know what a Cheshire cat is? Never. Well, it's a cat that's got so much of a smile, it's unbelievable, you can't, and, and it's really, really interesting. And he said, Jay, I did what you said. Now, I spend most of my life today solving problems, answering very scenario-specific questions, uh, extricating people from Gordian knots, I don't remember what I say because I go in the zone. I said, okay, what I say? And he reminded me, he said, great, that was a good, that was a good theory. What'd you do? He said, I went all over Asia. I went to Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, and he said, I found the largest lawnmower maker in Asia that had a second shift that wasn't even being fully utilized. We made a deal. I brought the tools and dies, and if you don't know what a tool and die is, they're the forms that mold and forge the metal that goes into the creation of whatever the product is and he said he provided the workers i trained them he already had salespeople and thousands of dealers and he said our first full year together we split 10 million dollars of profit but i've got stories like that uh that i, I mean there's enormous number of stories uh, the my my favorite story because i like cars is the porsche dealer story there was a man uh who loved porsches true story but he could never afford to even buy one but he loved Porsches and always wished for one. And he found out, he lived in California, he found out there was a dealership in Northern California that was available. He could buy it. Only one problem. He needed a million dollars down. He didn't even have enough money to buy a Porsche on credit versus a million dollars. But he went ahead and applied uh, for consideration and he got the, uh, the owner's manual, the owners of a dealership. And he went through it and he found a very interesting point that you could make almost an infinite number at this time of demos available to people. And a demo, if you don't know, is a car that's not licensed. It's functionally brand new. You let it, you can let it be driven. I think it's three months or 3,000 miles. I can't remember what the rules are. And still license it at new, sell it for a slight discount. And with that one realization, he ran ads all over Northern California that said, Drive a brand new Porsche every year for life for a one-time investment of $75,000. And his deal was, if you gave him the 75, he'd give you a demo. You'd have to keep changing out. And he got 200 plus people to do it. He created, he, he got, if you do the math, he got 500,000 more of operating capital. He hadn't, didn't have to give a penny of equity, didn't have any interest on the loan. Half the people bought the cars and he made a profit. They were the biggest advocate referring source he could have. And I've got you know, enormous numbers of stories like that. Uh, they're not stories that are bedtime stories that are fictional. There are people that learned how to use all kinds of facets of leverage. People don't know this. Carnival Cruise, 
You know what that is. Now yeah. I think they own five. They're multi, multi-billion. And, and the, the son of the founder is a billionaire. The founder was a billionaire, but he was poor. When he started, I knew the guy that helped him with marketing. He had one secondhand cruise ship and he couldn't even afford to paint one side of it. So he had to always bring it in unpainted. I mean, painted on the painted side, excuse me. I'm, I'm, I'm getting tangent. Uh, he w his boats would go, his boat, excuse me, would go out almost every week half filled. 400 rooms worth, let's call it $800 a room for a week unused. Now, if you look at it that way, it's sad. If you look at it another way, every week, he was creating and not using $320,000 worth of buying power that cost him almost nothing. My friend started going to radio stations, television stations, magazines, newspapers, and trading cruise uh, credit for advertising, but he would give the advertisers two years to use it and they would get their advertising right away. The advertisers would use it as uh, bonuses to employees, package it for advertisers, uh, contests, things like that. And they got $100 million of no-cost advertising. And to make it even more interesting, they did have a small sunk cost when somebody used the room in food and, and uh, housekeeping, and they charged people a hundred a ninety nine dollar uh, uh, usage fee, which covered all the cold cuts and all the sheets and the bleach, and the housekeepers. But uh, yeah, we've done more things probably through leverage. When I start with a company, I guess I should tell you this much too, because it's pretty interesting. We we basically uh, divide the company into two parts: what they're doing now and what they're not doing that they should be. And most people strive to start doing new things before they optimize or maximize what they're doing. When I look at what they're doing, most of the time I don't think it is even remotely close to optimal. And the reason is they've lived their whole life following uh, the crowd in that industry or whatever industry they came from and they don't even know the higher, better, more profitable, more rapid, more, more predictable, safer, less costly, alternatives, they just know what everybody else does and they really don't know how to take what they're doing even close to optimal. So even if I think it's a little bit or a lot dumb, as long as it's monetizing, if it's not monetizing, we stop it and they don't even know how to measure. We do. And then we, repl we, we maximize what they're doing first. And the reason we do that is that's driving their business. I don't want to stop that because we want to replace it with higher performing either replacements, uh, enhancements, alternatives, or additions, but we can't do that without having uh, experimental money, and they normally don't have that, so we create it from maximizing, doubling or tripling the result of their ad, doubling or tripling the conversions, doubling or tripling the size of the sale, doubling or tripling the residual value by figuring out better ways to sell them again when they have nothing else to sell, finding joint ventures where they can make more money than they did from their own product or service. And then we start adding or replacing with much higher performing alternatives, if that makes sense. Now that we have you in the flow, obviously. Yes. And you're ripping through questions. Well, this is what I do for a living. Uh, and when we, I mean, exactly, and it shows, right? We talked about preparing for this interview. I said, oh, no, I would have sent him a list of questions if that's what we're going to do. And you would have just done a video. Yes. And we've been done. And instead, we just had you talk about your genius, what you've done forever. I wouldn't say that. I've just been blessed to experience a lot that other people haven't. And to be able to communicate it in a way that we all can understand. They actually say, a lot of people are saying that genius is actually being able to take a complex term or idea or thought and making it so simple that everyone can understand. I agree. It. And I have been, this is interesting, I've been uh, not penalized, but a lot of my concepts have been discounted by people who are looking for silver bullets. Yeah. And the ability to take something complex and reduce it down to simple terms where everyone grasps it can be almost uh, counterintuitive because people can say, well, that doesn't sound very exciting. I'm looking for you know, the technological breakthrough. By the way, a very important point that most people get totally wrong. Uh, innovation is not necessarily 
uh, a function of technology. It can be enhanced by it, but it's nothing more than gr bringing greater advantage, benefit, uh, protection, enhancement, enrichment, entertainment, whatever your product does to your market that they can appreciate and value and desire only from you. How you create it, how you disseminate it can or cannot be uh, technologically driven. And a lot of people think that innovation has to be a byproduct of technology, and it doesn't. It has to be a byproduct of value creation beyond and above what your competitors are doing. So this is for the people out there watching right now. You're going to be at BDB Live 2.0. And you're going to be asked, answering questions. You're going to be sharing stories just like this, but also so solving problems. I like, like the to do carnival that. cruise, like the sure. motorcycle story, and like the many other stories that you have. I've seen your testimony of all the all the industries. If we just took one story from all those industries, we'd be here for a week. Well, I've and, been, I, you know, I've been doing this a long time. So why don't we look at them and say why? What's what's the reason they should be there? What's the reason that they should come? And obviously, if they've got this far in the interview. What's the motivation? What are you looking forward to solving for them at BDB Live that makes them come and listen to what you have to say there? Well, I, you know, I've been on a, you talk about this, and it also is an omission. One of the, 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 the points I left out about being preeminent is you have to be on a mission, a crusade, uh, wanting to really create uh, a very higher level purpose. I've been on a mission all my life to bring preeminence, to bring uh, strategic, critical thinking, to bring uh, more passion and purpose to people. And uh, I, I, I live in, in sadness seeing people invest the majority of their life, their opportunity cost, their, you know, their uh, well-being in an activity that either is underperforming profoundly its income and uh, and uh, satisfaction potential and not creating any asset value. And I look at a lot of people in smaller businesses and they'll ask me for advice on how to grow it. And I'll first of all say, well, why are you in that business when you're that young and your options using marketing leverage and, uh, and uh, preeminence could give you five times the income and maybe 20 times the wealth creation in something else, and I challenge them. So I guess if you want to be able to, I'm doing this as a labor of love, I guess the reason to be there is that I am not gonna sell anything, and I'm not asking, I mean, I did this as a service for Nick and, and Amanda. I'm not doing it for any other reason than I think it would be a privilege to help quality entrepreneurs who should be great see how to be great, and who should be greater uh, uh, strategic preeminent marketers see how to do that, and who should have a greater worldview of the meaning of business and personal life, learn it. So if you don't want that, don't come. I love it. Thank you so much, Jay, for- You're welcome. Thank you for yeah, the privilege. That, I loved when you got into that flow like that. That was, well, that was exciting. I got a little bit warm, actually. I need to, lucky I wore an undershirt. Well, I mean, you got me into my, my realm. That's what I, I said. The underpinning are what we talked about in the first part. The second part is what I do for a living for people, and it gets much deeper and broader than that. But, yeah, I mean, I like talking about it because it's exciting and it's ever-changing, and the, uh, the opportunities and the options people have in their business are so much greater than they ever realize and it's a tragedy that they live in a limited option uh, world when there's an infinite amount of possibilities available to them. Well, thank you guys so much for watching this exclusive interview with Jay Abraham. Like he said, if you want to grow your business, if you want to be the number one in your industry and have something of value to give to the world that gets you paid forever but also makes you fulfilled, you're going to want to be at BDB Live. You're not going to want to miss it. So go and grab your ticket right now. Get it done off the checklist, and I'll see you guys at BDB Live.